Alrighty, here we go with the second set of notes in our vertebrate units. In this set, we're going to focus on the organ systems found in fish and kind of lay the groundwork for things that we're going to compare later on. So a lot of things will be compared to the fish. The first system that I want to talk about is their circulatory system. We'll be talking about this system a lot. These guys have a closed circulatory system, which I'm sure you remember means that the blood is always in a vein or artery. And in fish, they have two chambers. They have one ventricle and one atrium. Those are the same chambers that you're going to see in all the different organisms that we're going to be looking at. Just the numbers of them might change. There's the ventricle that usually does the heavy pumping and then the atrium is kind of like the entryway for the ventricle. Since these guys only have two chambers, that means they have a single loop circulatory system. Again, we'll be talking about the number of loops a lot late in the coming lectures. And that basically means that blood flows from the heart in the case of the fish, to the gills, to the body, and back to the heart. Or if you look at the diagram over here, we've got your heart, and it's blue because the blood without oxygen goes to the gills, where it picks up its oxygen, and then gets delivered to the rest of the body. Here it is, dumping it off at the organs, and then the blood with the used blood with no oxygen goes back to the heart, and so on and so forth. Just one loop, heart to gills, heart to body. The good thing about this is it's a closed circulatory system, so blood with and without oxygen are not mixing, so they're not diluting the blood. But the problem is that, uh, as you can kind of see that in this diagram too, as the blood comes to the gills, it goes into smaller and smaller and smaller blood vessels till it gets to capillaries, which are very, very, very thin. Um, they're so small that the blood cells have to line up single file to get through them. They need to be like this so that the oxygen can diffuse into the blood cells from the gills, but the problem is it's like five lanes of traffic merging into one, right? And that's going to slow way, way, way down. So as the blood comes here, it has to slow down, and then as it leaves, it can't speed back up. There's nothing to accelerate it. It can only get go as fast as it's being pushed. So the problem is it's the blood slows way down in this one loop system. And it's going to probably slow down again here. So that's the downside to a single loop system. As far as the respiratory system of fish go, I'm sure you guys are pretty familiar with this. They have gills, obviously. So these are the gills supported by bones called gill arches, which we can see here. We talked about gill arches back in our evolution unit. And we talked about those bones in humans moving and forming the bones of our jaw and our middle ear and stuff like that. So we kind of have those same bones, just in a different spot. And then another important thing for fish is something called countercurrent flow. And what this means is that blood and water flow in opposite directions. It has nothing to do with the way the fish is swimming, if it's swimming upstream or downstream or with the current or against the current, it doesn't matter, right? Blood is always flowing into the gills, and then water is always flowing through the mouth past the gills and out this way. So water is always flowing this way, and blood tends to flow in this kind of way, all right? And why does it matter? What does it, what's the big deal? Well, we can look over here at this diagram, and this, the first one is if you had same current flow, so if they're flowing the same way. And you look, the blood would enter the gills lacking oxygen, and water would enter the gills being full of oxygen. And of course, we know about diffusion and concentration gradients, and so lots of oxygen would go into the blood. But what happens once you get to 50%? Now we have no more concentration gradient. We've reached equilibrium, and so this is never going to get any higher than 50%. If it gets to 51%, whoops, it's got to go back the other way. So it's reached equilibrium. 50% is the max. However, if you're going opposite, you can see by this diagram, you're never going to reach that equilibrium. Right? The blood's going to come in. There might not be much oxygen. There might not be a whole lot of oxygen here, but it's still a little bit, and it's still going to diffuse. Right? The, the, it's always, there's always an imbalance. There's always oxygen flowing this way, which allows the blood to contain, to carry a whole lot more oxygen in the end. So this is good because countercurrent flow will increase oxygen levels because you never reach equilibrium. And then a couple other systems. The swim bladder we've already talked about a little bit. This is how fish control their buoyancy, or I should say bony fish. Uh, the cartilage fish, the chondroictase, remember they have the oil in their, their liver. These guys have a swim bladder, or sometimes it's also called an air bladder, and it's just a sack full of air. And if they bring in more air, take more air, more oxygen out of the water, fills that up, just like if you take a deep breath, you float, they start to float. They want to get rid of it, they let some of that air out. That's how they control their position in the water, along with their fins and the ability to move and stuff like that. 
when you look at the brain of fish, you start to see that this is becoming a lot more advanced. There's multiple specialized areas called lobes, so the brain has lots of different lobes. If you look over here at the diagram of the brain, you can see the cerebellum, you can see the cerebrum, they've got a separate area for vision, the optic tectum, a separate area for smell, their medulla, and this is actually a lot of the same areas that you see in the human brain, right? Here's our cerebrum, our cerebellum, this is our medulla. Um, so a lot of the same same structures, obviously. They're not quite as advanced or as large as ours, but you can still see that it's starting to become more specialized. And so each part has its own special job, which is, makes it more effective, thus a little bit more advanced. And finally, just a little bit of reproductive system. These guys are mostly going to be external reproduction. Uh, we call this spawning. So the female might lay eggs. Maybe she makes a nest, maybe she doesn't, but lays some kind of eggs, and the male comes up and then disperses his gonads uh, around the eggs, and that's how fertilization is achieved. And with that, we are done with this set of notes.